Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. Janmashtami has just got over and tomorrow is also a big festival. It's not so easy to come, especially on a weekday evening. Since tomorrow is Radhashtami, so I'll speak today on the topic of appreciating the mood of Radharani by comparing the moods of Radharani and Sita Devi. So, one underlying theme which I will talk uh, is that the essence of love is sacrifice. People, the word love is very, very common. Uh, love means people say attraction. I feel very attracted to this person. Or love means warmth. Oh, in this person, people, this person, this person cares for me so much. No, attraction means I, I, I find this person so attractive or I feel that this person cares for me. So like that love can have many different meanings. And there is, there is the aspect of attraction, there is the attraction aspect of feeling cared for. But the essence of love is sacrifice. And if love is to be sustained, if love is to be nourished, then sacrifice is what enables us to take that love further and deeper. And this is what both these great personalities, Radha and Sita, demonstrate. So we will look at some incidents in their lives and we will look at especially the relationship that defines them, their relationship with their Lord. So broadly speaking, if we compare Krishna and Ram, Ram, Ram's character embodies dharma in a relatively straightforward way. Krishna embodies dharma in a much more complicated way. Now, uh, in general, people can find something objectionable about Ram, but overall his character is exemplary. Hmm? About Krishna, now there are so many things, especially in the Mahabharata and everything, it can be very confusing. So both of them embody dharma, but in different ways. And this increase in complexity of what they embody is also reflected in the increase in complexity of their relationship with their consort. So for example, if we consider the relationship of Sita and Ram, uh, if you consider it a traditional society where primarily most marriages were arranged, so then it was their marriage was like that. Krishna, uh, in, uh, Ram, and Sita, they at least in their manifestation in this world apparently didn't know each other. And it is when Ram entered into Ayodhya, from, uh, from Ayodhya he went to the forest with Vishwamitra and Vishwamitra took him to Mithila. Mithila Purajan Mohakarama, Videha Manas Ranjakarama. So there it was that Sita saw Ram for the first time and Ram Sita, Ram saw Sita for the first time. So that was their meeting and there in that meeting, or after that, not a meeting actually, just a beholding each other. Then after that, in the Swayamvar, it was that Ram not only raised the bow and strung the bow, but broke the bow. So nowadays in corporate world, they talk about, you shouldn't just meet expectations, you should exceed expectations. So <laughs> Ram demonstrates that. <laughs> Exceeding expectations. So totally that it is like, you don't just meet a standard, you break the standard itself. So, and then Ram gallantly wins the hand of Sita. See, Arpit Sita Varmalik Rama. She offered her Varmala. Now, if you consider the relationship of Krishna and Ra Sita, as Krishna and Radha rather, it's much more complex. Say, they live, first of all, Sita and Ram live in two different kingdoms. 
whereas radha and krishna live more or less in the same community it is a it is small different villages different towns you could say but it is broadly the same community and it is that right from the beginning radha rani is of course at that time she is not radha rani she is radha she is just a small baby mm, so her the first thing she saw is krishna it is she refused to open her eyes she refused to do anything and her parents were wondering what has happened to her and now there's a new baby in the house everybody comes and wants to see so they invited nand maharaj also to come Shibhan went keep the iron man krishna came over there krishna crawled over krishna was also not very old at that time so krishna crawled over and he peered into the crib where radha was there and as soon as she she knew that krishna was looking over there so then she opened her eyes so she wanted to begin her journey in life with the sight of the lord and at one level both these relationships they are transcendental pure exalted so exalted that we can't even in many ways conceive uh, the purity and the uh, level of that relationship but in some other ways we can also say that these relationships they represent how we as souls would like to would aspire to relate with our lord so madraksham hinasya punyam mukundamala stotra and many other verses in the by the saints they say that actually i do not want to, i do not want even i do not want to even see people in whose heart krishna is not manifest krishna is present in everyone's hearts but people who are godless then i don't even want to see them a devotee Wants to simply behold the form of the Lord. Drishti hi satam darshane istu bhavat tanu nam. The Nalakuvar and Manigri, the Kuvair Kumaras, they, after they are delivered by Krishna, they offer this prayer: "My dear Lord, in this world we are not as fortunate that we can see the Lord directly. It's it's very rare to have the darshan of the Lord directly. But they say, let us behold the form of your devotees." and seeing your devotees is not different from seeing you drishti hi satam darshane satam darshane so radha rani right from her childhood or not even childhood infancy her attraction to krishna is manifest and then as they start growing up actually the dream of everyone in vrindavan Uh, is that radha and krishna be united <clears throat> everything in this world in some way or the other in a purer form is present in the spiritual world so in, in practically every community after people go beyond a particular age now one co- uh, common pastime for people is match making <laughs> <laughs> oh pair this boy with this girl pair this girl with this boy and now at one level it can be distracting at one level it can be intrusive at uh, one level it can just lead to a lot of gossip but that is present in its purest form in the spiritual world where the longing of everyone there is that radha and krishna be united and that's what the brajwasi's dream now she, he is the uh, he is such a sweet wonderful boy and she's such a sweet wonderful girl and they grow up and the acharyas describe that their relationship as i said the relationship begins from childhood from in, not even childhood infancy itself and our gaudi acharyas have described how radha is present everywhere in krishna's past times so for example when krishna is in the clutch clutches of kaliya and 
it appears as if he is almost dead and seeing him motionless near death it is all the Vrajivasis who have become petrified they are near death and yet Krishna stays just like that and now the Bhagavatam is is gently indicative pointing towards Radharani the Bhagavatam doesn't directly talk about Radharani because uh, there are different answers, explanations but Shukde Goswami is afraid that he will get so overwhelmed with ecstasy on remembering Radharani that he won't be able to serve he won't be able to speak mm -hmm. See, even if we are going to speak about something which is very emotional emotion, the summit of pure emotion but even to speak about pure emotion we need some control over emotion <laughs> it's ironical that bhakti is all about emotion but if we are to give the experience of bhakti to others then we have to rein in our emotions so, so he, does, he just points to Radharani, he doesn't mention it but what he points toward our acharyas explicate it they elaborate it they reveal the hidden nuggets over there so they explain that actually so it is in the in the Bhagavatam it is said that Krishna was in the clutches of Kaliya for some time and then he broke free and then he started dancing on Kaliya so our acharyas explain that Krishna was waiting he was going to do his first public dance performance <laughs> and he wanted his beloved to see it so the news that Krishna was in the clutches of Kaliya it spread rapidly but still Barsana was some distance away so for the residents of Barsana to come running to there it took some time and then once Radha came over there Krishna said, now let the show begin <laughs> <laughs> and Krishna started dancing over there so that way our Acharya described that Radha is present everywhere in Krishna Leela in fact they also say that in the Damodar Leela we say that it is the two fingers were shot that one finger was Ishwada's endeavor the other was Krishna's mercy that's true now Raja has also explained that Krishna waited for a particular point and eventually he was tied by Yashoda so what was that point? that point was that when this news spread again that Krishna was tied everybody from nearby came around and the neighbors all brought their ropes but they were all short finally Radha came over there and Radha untied her ribbon and gave it to Yashoda and when that ribbon was added to the rope Krishna said now I will be conquered by the love so Radha is like the invisible presence in all the beautiful pastimes of Krishna and <coughs> in this way we see there is a special we could say sweetness in the pastimes of Radha and Krishna because it's a simple small village whereas Ayodhya also has a sweetness but there is regality over there there's magnificence there is Aishwarya very prominently present mm. so uh, Sita grows up very conscious that she is a princess that's okay She is very conscious that she is the princess and she has to act in accordance with the dignity of the position of a princess. Radharani also has her sweet dignity but she is a village girl. Vikretu kama kilagopa kanya that uh, there is no description of Sita ever going out to do any work mm. but Radha, she is living in a village and in the village although they are rich in natural opulence but still it works so the gopis would go to sell 
They'd want to call out that, oh, we've got curd, we've got butter. But they were so absorbed in Krishna that instead of speaking about curd and milk, they would say, Govinda Damodar Madhaveti. Kindly repeat, Govinda Damodar Madhaveti. So their hearts are filled with so much love for Krishna that that love would overflow. So, in psychology there is something called the Freudian slip of the tongue. That means slip of the tongue is where we speak something that we didn't intend to speak. But Now, sometimes it is just an accident and we speak something entirely different from what we wanted to speak. But a Freudian slip of, slip of the tongue is where something which we had hidden in our heart suddenly comes out. And we didn't want to say it so the slip of tongue is not something which is just mistaken, something which is intentionally to be hidden, it comes out. So, so, uh, so similarly here, although they want to do some work, but they just can't. So Radha, she uh, at one level she has that, she is the consort of Krishna, but it's, it's a pastoral paradise, Vrindavan. And in that, just like Krishna goes out to work, Krishna he goes out to graze the cows. Charayan Pashun. He goes out to graze the cows. And similarly, he goes out, uh, Radha also goes out. She goes out to sell the cow products. The gifts that the cow has given, they try to give those to the world. And it is when Krishna and Radha go out, both, then they have many sweet meetings. They have rendezvous in this forest, where, where Krishna often does many mischievous things. And sometimes you meet someone and say, we, we know person A and we know person B. And then we may think maybe person A and person B don't know each other, so we try to we introduce them. Say, actually, we know each other, we go back a long time. We know each other for decades. So like that, now Radha and Krishna, they go back for a long time. And in their meetings in the forest, at different times, Krishna and Radha, they all tried, they have a game of loving one-upsmanship. That means, Radha tries to outwit Krishna and Krishna tries to outwit Radha. So Rupa Goswami has composed a very beautiful uh, series of prayers called Radha Krishna Ashtakam. So therein he says how Krishna and Radha are saturated with each other. And this saturation, this complete absorption of their consciousness in each other it manifests in different ways. So, that because that reverence is somewhat lesser. So, in the Ramayana, the Ramayana also has a sweetness. But, Sita has that mood of reverence toward Ram. Hmm? There is of course, in love sometimes there is sparring. You, you, you speak something which is teasing the other person and I speak something which we speak, one person teases the other person, the other person teases the first person. So, there is a devotee who, uh, very wonderful devotee, he has a very wry sense of humour. So, recently I gave a class and then after that, he came to me and said, your class was brilliant. So, normally I ask, what did you like about the class? So he said, everything except what you spoke. 
everything except what you spoke <laughs> so that was basically uh, he was trying to be sweetly sarcastic so then after that there were some children whom he was asking what do you like in krishna consciousness so i said can i answer said yeah everything except you <laughs> so uh, sometimes when there is a close affection if there is no affection and then somebody speaks like this what is going on you would consider it as an insult how dare you speak like that? everything but when there is affection then even even apparently insulting words add to the love so context determines everything if somebody says i liked everything except the class except what you spoke then normally you would say what kind of how can you speak like this but in affection if affection is the foundation then the richness of the relationship requires various flavors if it's only i appreciate you and you appreciate me yes there is sweetness in that but it is i try to tease you and then you try to tease me and then there is the loving one upsmanship in that and that is the flavor that krishna relishes with radha and krishna longs for it sometimes in our childhood say if our mother had cooked some very sweet delicacy and then we loved it in our childhood and then we grow up and maybe our mother is far away or she is no more and then we want we want to have the delicacy and then whoever cooks that uh, they may cook the same item but they may not get the same flavor the same taste so if there is something which we had cherished in the childhood we long for it constantly when can i get it so krishna gets that flavor in his relationship with radha where there is spice there is sweetness has its own taste but spice has its own taste also so sweetness means oh you are so wonderful and you say i am so wonderful but spice comes when there is sarcasm there are taunts there is insult so krishna he is he gets that in his relationship with radha and he longs for it constantly and that's what he tries to get in his relationship with rukmini with rukmini he tries to taunt her so what is he doing over here in gopal in gopal champu krishna consoles the brajwasis by sending a message that is for the brajwasis endearing and for the dwarka vasis infuriating so what is that message the brajwasis are always hoping that krishna will come back and when will krishna come back when 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 that is the constant longing of their hearts and especially when krishna gets married then normally if somebody gets married that means they going to settle over there and then they may they will lose hope will krishna ever come back uh, then they start thinking and especially if somebody gets married and they have the family responsibilities they have their professional responsibilities then then the likelihood of their coming back becomes very low just like many of many of us are indians over here so many we have immigrated over here so if a parents might have some hope to come back there of course many parents will have the hope i want to come here that is also different but they have a hope but if the, the children get married and they settle over here then the likelihood that they will come becomes very low so similarly when krishna gets married now krishna is the center of the heart and the lives of the rajwasis and that marriage is such a thing you cannot keep secret and especially for krishna he knows i cannot keep this hidden from the rajwasis but at the same time he knows that they will be hard broken so then krishna sends a message to the gopis and he says actually for the purpose of forming alliances 
to protect the yadus i have to get married but you know, i married these princesses simply because they remind me of you they remind me of you but i am longing for you and i will come back to you soon so now we may say this is no the this is this is what is krishna doing over here is it, is it that he is actually not caring for the dwarka vasis for the dwarka queens no he cares for the dwarka mahishis also definitely but the point is when there is a comparison in rasas between dwarka and vrindavan the gauri acharya describe how vrindavan's rasa is much much higher so the point i am making over here is that krishna wants even when he is relating with rukmini he is remembering his relationship with radha and is longing for that and does when he has the sweet interactions he tries to provoke rukmini and he tries to provoke rukmini now rukmini does not understand so if somebody who has been very serious and grave suddenly they start joking and they start saying so what happened to you no who are you where did this person where did the original person go and who is the substitute who looks like him but who is he so rukmini just can't process what's happening but what is krishna trying to do krishna is actually trying to get the same flavor of the sweet relationship that he had with radha rani and as they grow up this loving sparring becomes more and more now the whole setting of of vrindavan is the setting of love but i started by talking about how love requires sacrifice without sacrifice love is neither tested nor tasted you can say there is love but love is tested is the real love and what is the depth of that love that is tasted when sacrifice is called for so in both krishna leela and ram leela uh, the both krishna krishna and radha and ram and sita both of them have to go through sacrifices but the nature of the sacrifices are significantly different in uh, in ram leela the sacrifice through which sita's love for krishna for ram is demonstrated is that she who has grown up always as a princess suddenly has to not has to chooses to go to the forest so she actually ram comes with the full intention of dissuading her and in fact ram gives a whole speech where he is in one sense trying to scare sita so that she will not go to the forest but in spite of that she determinedly goes to the forest and this willingness to share the pains not just the joys but the pains of one's loved one that is the test of her love so she sacrifices her royalty for her loyalty sacrifices her royalty the royal opulence that she has for her loyalty to her husband and that's great sacrifice it's it's extraordinary it's and it's very very difficult to do something like that now radha sacrifice is 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 of a almost entirely different category the whole principle of krishna leela is that uh, generally if we consider there is the there is the bad and the good this is the duality and if we want to go towards god we have to give up the bad there are anti devotional activities there are sinful activities uh, those we have to be given up and giving up the bad is also difficult so giving up the bad for god is also a sacrifice but a 
God, so if we have this duality of good and bad, we might say God is on the side of good. And we give the bad and go towards good. But actually, God transcends this category of bad and good. And to go toward God, we not only have to give up the bad, but we also have to give up the good. And that's why we see the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna initially says, Dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavame yuge yuge. He says, I descend to establish Dharma. That's 4 8. But after that, in 1866, towards the end, he says, Sarva Dharman Parityaja So now, Dharma is good. Like there is one, I was at one program uh, where there's a Gita recitation contest, or Gita, Gita, Gita Jayanti, and there the children were reciting the Gita. And when they recited the Gita, they recited this verse as, Sarva dharman parityajya mame kam sharanam raja. So they made it into a dharman. I said, how can Krishna tell us to give dharma? Give up dharma. Actually, he's telling a dharma. So it's a mistake over there. It's not a mistake actually. So Krishna is saying, yes, I come to establish dharma, but ultimately to attain bhakti, you have to give up even dharma. So to give up the bad, to come to the good is good. But to go to God, we have to not only give up the bad, but we may have to even give up the good. And what is the good that is to be given up? That Radharani demonstrates through her life. And that is, <coughs> Sita at least has the honor of being a duly wedded wife. And within that, within that uh, relationship, that honorable relationship, she exhibits extremes of sacrifice. And uh, uh, honorable dharmic relationship is good. It's important for the stability of society, for the continuance of human humanity. But in the Radha's case, the setting in Vrindavan is arranged in such a way that she, for Krishna's sake, has to sacrifice even the honor of being an honorable wife. Now that is an excruciatingly difficult sacrifice. So for, especially in a traditional society, for a woman, her honor was very important. For a man also, his honor was important in terms of his word of honor. But now, for the setting of Rindavan is such that even the good has to be given up for God. And Radharani demonstrates that. Pati Sutanvaya Bratri Bandavan Ati Vilangyate Antya Chutagataha Antya Chutagataha. The gopis are praying to Krishna in the Gopi Gita that Krishna, we have come deep into this forest and we have given up everything. We have given up all our family members to come to you. Because you called us, we gave up everything. And of course, the Bhagavatam is careful that while transcending dharma, it doesn't trample on dharma. That it doesn't dismiss dharma or deride dharma. So at one level, when the act of the demonstrating the gopis' love for Krishna, is talked about, the Bhagavatam describes that actually they left everyone and their, all their family members were opposing but still they came to Krishna. And in that kind of society, for they, when they left, they didn't even know whether they would be ever accepted back. And they were literally leaving everything for Krishna's sake. So the gopis actually demonstrate Sarva Dharman Parityaj. And among those gopis, Radharani is the topmost. So Radharani's sacrifice is that she gives up even the good for God. Of course, she doesn't give it up. Why not? Because at a deeper level, what happens is that 
while radharani goes the gopis go and they have wonderful ras leela and actually even in the ras leela how at one level radharani is celebrated as the topmost lover of krishna as the one with the topmost love for krishna but anandavan champu oh, is a beautiful book written by kavi karnapur and therein he analyzes the whole of the ras leela to demonstrate that actually the ras leela uh, shows radharani not just as the greatest lover but as the greatest sacrificer if we get time i'll discuss that later but at this point the i'm talking about this tension between transcending dharma and respecting dharma so when so what happens is there is the bad there is the good and there is god so now for the sake of god good has to be given up but when most people give up good they may not rise towards god they will descend toward the bad so for most people maintaining the dignity of the good is very important it, the dignity of the good is very important to be maintained and the bhagavatam does that and how the bhagavatam does that is it describes that after the ras leela when all the gopis come back none of their family members resent their having gone away because it is said yogamaya factions forms of the gopis who were there with their family members and thus they thought yes this gopis wanted to go and they tried to go but he stopped them and they stopped so that means dharma is also honored dharma so the good is honored but at the same time it, the good is also transcended so uh, in that sense radharani never loses her reputation but she doesn't know this is going to happen when she goes out she is ready to give up everything for krishna and in this to give up the good so there is as i said there is immoral there is bad which is below morality there is immoral there is moral and then there is transmoral the transmoral is that which is above morality however for those who are not very discerning the transmoral and the immoral can appear very similar in fact that they may think that the transmoral is actually nothing but the immoral and they may think that okay why is something transmoral being celebrated and worship like that and that is a common criticism of the bhagavatam by skeptical to the skeptical people that it 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 seems to celebrate immorality but the bhagavatam is itself conscious of this this potential for criticism and the bhagavatam commentators have cautioned us that don't think of this to be ordinary why is it not ordinary because this is demonstrating the highest love now to to understand the magnitude of the sacrifice uh, let's look at other incidents which demonstrate the love of krishna for radha and radha for krishna if we consider the love of sita and ram mm-hmm. they are const- they, in the forest also they are together and lakshman is there to attend to them and lakshman facilitates so that they can always be together and they have very sweet intimate past times together uh at the same time in their relationship there is of course a traumatic separation when ravan abducts her and there is also eventually another separation when sita is sent away by ram and all those demonstrate sacrifice in different ways uh, that will not be able to go into today but here the principle of sacrifice first to understand that something is immoral is not immoral but transmoral we need to understand how there is a principle of sacrifice see the whole idea of morality is to bring us out of selfishness every one of us tends to be 
at one level selfish see children they are all small children they are innocent but if you want to look at it positive they are sweet and innocent but if you want to look at it negatively they are so self centered now they, they may not be conscious that they are self centered but any time they have any need they will start crying sometimes you see small babies and sometimes you are amazed you know that's that size of the most advanced loud speaker cannot make as much noise as a baby can make <laughs> isn't it there's so much energy they have there in their throat sometimes so now they are not even conscious of anything and they may cry suddenly in the midnight they may cry suddenly in the middle of a serious, a serious discussion and now they not they may be crying because they are in pain or they may be crying because they need attention whatever but they are very self centered one sign of growing is that we learn how to socialize socialize means that we learn how to behave in different settings and that means we become conscious of those settings that means we are not driven only by our emotions so moral codes of any kind they are basically meant to bring us out of our self consciousness me and my desires and my emotions and my pleasures i have to become conscious of something more than that so beyond that is as our consciousness goes upward we learn to follow codes but then we have to go further than that just like say somebody is learning karate or judo or whatever then there are some standard defenses which they need to learn how oh, if this happens do this do this do this do this or if you consider cricket you know there are standard ways in which okay you get a you get a ball near your bat like this you get a ball on the body you do like this get a ball over here do like this. there are some standard strokes so a good player needs to learn all the standard strokes a good good batsman or a good uh, martial arts player need to know all the standard moves all the good moves but beyond being good is being great and a great player knows all the standard moves and can do them expertly but the great player does something unexpected and that's how say this this way the opponent is attacking and the opponent knows when i attack this way he'll defend this way and that's what this normal normal well trained player would do but a great player does something entirely unexpected and that's what makes them rise them from the good to the great so good habits have to be learned before they have to be transcended similarly morality has to be learned before it has to be transcended and to understand the gopis transmor a transcendental morality or that they are transmoral we need to look at the principle of sacrifice so their sacrifice melts krishna's heart and how is it that when krishna now when krishna is in the ras leela at that time he disappears the gopis are devastated how can krishna disappear like this and then start searching searching everywhere for krishna and then krishna decides to appear in the form of vishnu now vishnu and krishna share the same similar complexion broadly speaking and from a distance when the gopis see they delight that oh it's krishna and they run toward krishna and then they see it is vishnu now normally for the yogis it is their deepest aspiration to have a little darshan of krishna dhyana vasthita tad gate na manasa pashyanti am yogino but when the gopis see krishna they are disappointed they are unbearably disappointed it's like somebody comes say running to meet us and then they say oh it's you <laughs> so they ask oh krishna the vishnu they offer their pranams to vishnu and then they ask oh, can you did you see krishna can you tell me where is krishna so then now vishnu is also it's krishna is playing as vishnu so he's so excited he is so delighted to see the love of the gopis that he also becomes overwhelmed 
and then he points with his fingers. He can't speak because his speech will give him away. So he points. And he points and the gopis thank him and run. And now, well, normally, when the gopis are searching for Krishna, you would, you would think that Radharani is the f first in searching for Krishna. But in this case, Radharani is the last. And why she is the last? Because she is searching everywhere. He is searching there, thinking we should not miss Radha. We should not miss Krishna. She is searching everywhere. And then, like different people, if we have lost something, we search at one place. And sometimes we search second time, we search third time. So Radharani is the most meticulous searcher. Is Krishna hiding anywhere? Is Krishna anywhere? So she searches and then she comes there. And then she asks, with such fervent, desperate love, where is Krishna? And when Krishna hears this, he points with his two hands, with his, hand, with his fingers, he has four arms, he tries to point, but what happens? His Radha's love is so great that Krishna's two arms disappear. Krishna's two arms just disappear. It, there, there are different mystical powers by which uh, those with those powers can assume different forms. But they need a certain level of self-awareness, a certain level of consciousness by which they can maintain that form. It's just like somebody is playing a uh, fancy dress competition. Say they put on a big moustache or a big beard or a big wig. Now, they need to not get over excited. They get over excited, then what happens is maybe their wig falls away. So, it's not that simple, but they have to, for to maintain a, maintain a form, there has to be a certain level of self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's why when the demons are about to die, whichever form they may have taken up, that form disappears and their original form comes up. Putana has come in a form of a beautiful damsel, then she becomes this a ghastly witch. So, so th that same principle applies over here. So, when Krishna sees Radha, Krishna forgets his Krishna consciousness. Or we could say Krishna forgets not his Krishna consciousness, but his Vishnu consciousness. Of course, he is Krishna with a plan to be Vishnu. So, it is Krishna consciousness. As per his Krishna consciousness, he wants to be Vishnu. But he forgets that. So what happens is that love melts Krishna's not only his heart internally but his form externally. And then that same Radha who is calling out, where is Krishna? She says Krishna right in front of her, her beloved eye. Her beloved is in front of her eyes. And then her eyes drink the beautiful form of Krishna. So here is one glimpse of Radha's love for Krishna. That now Krishna knows the love of Radharani for Krishna for him. Of course, even he doesn't know fully, but he knows. But he wants the world to know. And because he wants the world to know, what does he do? He enacts the pastime where he pretends to have a headache. Now, actually, he's not just pretending. In a sense, he has that headache. He is in pain. And normal Nashir Nadabuni is concerned, hey, what happened? What can I do for you? So he says, there's only one medicine. Tell me what is it? I'll get it from anywhere. He says, I need the dust on the feet of my devotees. And Narabuni, oh, this, how can I do this? Now Narabuni is so humble, he doesn't think I am a devotee and I can give my dust. He thinks that, okay, who is a devotee? And he goes around and asks the various devotees and nobody is ready. Till finally he comes to the gopis. And among the gopis again, it is Radharani who is most prominent. And they, they say that, take as much dust as you want and go immediately. <laughs> and now, at this point, Narmuni starts thinking, hey, what's going on? Maybe these gopis don't understand what they are doing. He says, do you understand that if the dust of your feet touches Vishnu's head, the 
then you will go to hell. And the Brajvasis say, the gopis say that, if you thought that Krishna has a headache, is itself hell for us. If Krishna can get relief from his headache, that is what will get us out of hell. And if to get Krishna, to give Krishna relief for even one moment, if we have to go to hell forever, we are ready to do that. So, what Sita does, the forest is not hell, but forest is a terrible place. So, what Sita does for Ram's sake, the gopis are also ready to do for Krishna's sake. Not just do that, but do much more. And just as in a normal level, if we don't understand the context, somebody giving their dust to God, it's almost like you are not kicking, but what is on the foot you are giving? It, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. So here, if we understand the context, we understand it is a sacrifice. It's a glorious sacrifice. But even this at first glance will seem offensive. So we can say this is, this is, uh, there is some, somebody who doesn't know uh, the, the position of God. I was once giving a class recently on Janmashtami. And I said that how the, the Vrajivasis don't accept Krishna as God. And then as one person in the audience, he said, I also don't accept Krishna as God. <laughs> now there is a big difference. There is not accepting Krishna because of, uh, as God because of transcendence. And there is not accepting Krishna as God because of ignorance. <laughs> and the two are opposite. So, somebody doesn't know the proper way of worshipping the Lord. And then they do something like this. Let their foot touch a, touch a sacred image. Or let the dust from their foot go there. That will be, hey, it's, it will be horrible, it will be a terrible thing to do. So, that is below the rules. The gopis want to give the dust. That is above the rules. They are doing something, they are following the rules and they are doing something more than what the rules require. So just as in this case, what the gopis are doing can be seen as wrong. But it is transcendentally extraordinarily right. But in this case, because there is no sensual connotation, we don't see that as, oh, yeah, this is great sacrifice. But actually, the same thing is what gopis demonstrate when they are ready to leave everything to go for Krishna's sake. So at one level, which we see, what is this? this is wrong? How can they live like this? But actually what they are doing is, they are doing something which is extraordinary. They know the rules, but their purpose goes beyond the rules. So the gopis are demonstrating how one should give up the good for God. And among those gopis, Radha is the topmost. So Sita, she gives up the royal comforts for doing her duty loyally and that's glorious. Now, Radha gives up the reputation of loyalty for her devotion to the Lord. And as that sacrifice is far, far greater. And as it is that, it is Krishna who himself wants to know what is the love of Radharani for me. What is the love that she has? What, what makes her do something like this? And to know that, he himself decides to come as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And that same mood of sacrifice that the Radharani demonstrates in her relationship with Krishna, that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his followers in the renounced order demonstrate for the service to Krishna. The Goswamis had enormous wealth, position, followers, but they gave it up for Krishna. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was a brilliant scholar with many, many followers, living in a place where scholarship was hugely valued, and he gave it up for Krishna. So generally, there are two conceptions of success. The Brahminical conception of success is based on knowledge. The Kshatriya conception of success is based on power and wealth. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his followers, they had both of these successes. And they gave both, all of it up for Krishna. And for us, that same principle of sacrifice, how we can live it in our lives is demonstrated 
we can't directly imitate the gopis of Rindavan, but we can follow in their footsteps by following the footsteps of those who manif of how they manifest in God Leela. So that mood of sacrifice in trying to serve the Lord is the essence of what Radharani is. And if we can get even a little a drop of that sacrificing spirit, then our devotion will blossom. And it is when we get the opportunity to sacrifice, our devotion is tested. But then devotion is not just tested, it is also tasted. When we actually learn to sacrifice, when we give ourselves in a mood of service to Krishna, then our consciousness gets absorbed more and more. And what we may be called to sacrifice, we don't know. Sometimes we may have to sacrifice our physical comforts for Krishna's sakes. Sometimes we may have to sacrifice our, you could say, our intellectual comforts in terms of our plan of how to serve Krishna. And we may have to take up something else, some other way to serve Krishna. Sometimes we may have to sacrifice our relational comforts. That means there is a certain group of devotees with whom we are serving and that's wonderful. But then sometimes our service requires us to do something else. Prabhupada writes in Lilamrut, in the first Janmashtami in America, he said that all my god brothers must be celebrating Janmashtami. Everybody will be filled with the Krishna my atmosphere in Vrindavan. I am all alone over here. And at that time, nobody around him even knew about Krishna so much. So Prabhupada felt deeply lonely. He was with Krishna, but still. So Prabhupada had to sacrifice that. So what we may have to sacrifice, we don't know. But if we strive to according to our capacity, then we will strengthen and deepen our devotion. And we can pray to Srimati Radharani that she bless us with a drop of her sacrificing spirit. So that when life challenges us, when our services challenge us, we may be true to those challenges. And by her mercy, we can get a glimpse of the infinite love that she is relishing and that she is offering to Krishna. Srimati Radharani ki, Sri Radha Ashtami Mahotsav ki. So I'll quickly summarize. I spoke on the topic of how Radharani we compared the love of the moods of Sita and Radha to understand how the essence of love is sacrifice. It is not just attraction, it is not just feeling warmth and belonging, it is offering of ourselves in love. And broadly speaking, both Ram and Krishna demonstrate dharma, but Krishna demonstrates dharma in much more complex ways. The subtleties and complexities of life that Krishna demonstrates are also demonstrated in his relationship with his consort. So Sita and Ram meet in a in an arranged marriage kind of setting and then in a royal swayamvar Sita's hand is won by Ram. In the case of Ra, Krishna and Radha they know they go a long long way back. Radha's first sight is Krishna and in all Krishna's important pastimes Radha is often a invisible but vital presence. Not a uh, that Krishna waits to dance on Kaliya till Radha comes. Krishna doesn't let himself get, get tied till the Radha provides a ribbon from her. And while, Radha, while, while Sita and Ram have a very respectful relationship, Radha spars with Krishna. And Krishna longs for that sparring, that intimate love is seen not just through sweet appreciation of each other, but love is also seen through spice, like spices, barbs, taunts, but in love. So Krishna longs for that even when he's out of Vrindavan, and that's what he seeks even with Rukmini. So, Rasa Sita sacrifices her royalty for her loyalty. She gives up royal opulence to go to the forest. But she has the honor of a duly wedded wife. Whereas Radha, the whole setting of Rindavan is arranged so that she gives up her reputation of loyalty for offering herself to Krishna. 
so the Bhagavatam demonstrates this tension of transcending dharma at the same time maintaining dharma. That the, it appears as if the gopis didn't go. So I talked about the immoral, moral and transmoral. So for the sake of God, the bad has to be given up. But for the sake of God, even the good has to be given up. Just like say in karate or in cricket. The, the standard ways of playing have to be learned for a person to play to become good. But for the player to become great, they have to learn how to respond in non-standard ways. Not because they don't know the standard habits, but they can do better than the standard habits. So, how to play expertly in the standard way? That is what good is demonstrated by good. But the gopis demonstrate something beyond that. And that, that because it's a it's a male female relationship sometimes relationship so it might appear immoral but it is transmoral and to understand this i talked about how when the gopis offer the dust of their feet to krishna go the gopis love melts krishna's heart and it melts krishna's arms which has two extra arms but krishna wants to demonstrate this love to everyone and thus he asks for the dust so just as the uninformed person might touch touch do something like that and that will be offensive but the gopis do it it appears as if they don't it is something which they don't know the rules but they know the rules and they know much more than that the purpose of the rules so their sacrifice is so great that krishna himself wants to know what is that love that makes them sacrifice and thus he comes as chaitanya mahaprabhu and chaitanya mahaprabhu and his followers demonstrate the same sacrificing spirit in a more accessible way for us so if we can also develop that spirit of sacrifice and our love will be tested and tasted through the sacrifices we can do in our life of service to Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, do we have time for any questions? Yes. Okay. Yes, Madhavi. I have a few questions, so you don't have to stop me. Um, <clears throat> you know, we see that um, the gopis are willing to sacrifice their reputation to meet with Krishna you know, in the dead of night. You know, they're willing to go to hell for Krishna by giving up the, the you know, giving the dust of their feet. So we see that the gopis are willing to do anything for Krishna. So what do we see in Radharani's behavior that is that surpasses that of the gopis so much that she has Come for tomorrow's class in CNJ. <laughs> Come for tomorrow's class in CNJ. <laughs> oh, I am coming. Okay. I'll answer over there. What is special about Radharani's what is special about Radharani's love which transcends all the gopis love uh, basically it is that even when she is with krishna she is thinking of krishna but she is also thinking of the gopis i'll just tell one point from this one of those beautiful points like we know when in the ras leela when um, it said the gopis become proud and then krishna disappears from them he goes with Radharani and Radharani becomes proud. Mm -hmm. And then Krishna disappears from her also. Mm -hmm. But actually, it is all a competition of selflessness. That the gopis are all with Krishna and the gopis feel that actually none of our love compares with, with Radha's love for Krishna. Although they all love Krishna, but they know Radha's love is far, far greater. So they think that yes, we want to be with Krishna, but Radha, Radha deserves specially to be with Krishna. And thus, they act as if they are proud. And Krishna goes away with Radharani. And once Radharani understands that, oh, Krishna is with me alone. She's, she's so happy to be singled out for that special attention. But in the next moment, she thinks, hey, what am I doing? If my Sakhis like Lalita and Vishaka, they will be heartbroken to be without Krishna. And if they don't have Krishna, how can I be happy? And 
it is out of concern for them that she says that Krishna, I'm very tired. I can't, I'm very tired. I can't walk any further. And then Krishna seems to get angry. And Krishna says, now because this is a forest, I cannot get a palanquin for you. So sit on my back and I'll carry you. And then Krishna says this in an angry tone and he disappears. And then he disappears. Radharani is devastated. What happened? She had no desire to offend Krishna. She only just wanted to avoid the distress that her friends were going through. Now Krishna understands that, but Krishna wants all the Sakhis also to know that Radha was thinking about them. And thus Krishna disappears even from them. So the, so the speciality of Radha Rani is that she, she loves Krishna deeply, but she also loves those who love Krishna deeply. And thus, she doesn't want to be alone happy with Krishna. She wants, and she wants to be happy with Krishna, but she wants others to also be with Krishna. So that is one pastime which demonstrates how Radharani is not, not delighting in solitary ecstasy. I alone. Everybody, she wants that. Although she is special. Now from a philosophical perspective, Radharani is Ladini Shakti. That means that whatever devotion whoever has, it all comes from Radharani. So the Sakhis, their devotion also comes from Radharani. Even Yashoda's devotion comes from Radharani. Because Radharani is not just one person. Radharani is the Radharani is the source of all devotion. So basically, there are two conceptions of masculine divinity. Similarly, there are two conceptions of feminine divinity. Masculine divinity means the like Krishna. So at one level, Krishna is the best of all beings. We talk about how different beings have different qualities and Krishna has 64 qualities. So Krishna is the best of all beings. But Krishna is not just the best of all beings. Krishna is the basis of all being also. Nothing can exist without him. Whatever quality he has, so it is that Krishna has 64 and say maybe Vishnu has 60 and Brahma, uh, Brahma has 50. But it is not that Brahma's 50 qualities are separate from Krishna's 64. It is his qualities also come from Krishna only. So that means the masculine divinity is seen in two ways. One is he is the best of all being, but other is he's the basis of all being also. And whoever has any qualities, they all come from Krishna. So similarly, Radharani's conception also these two ways. That she is the best of all devotees. She has the best of all devotion, but she is also the basis of all devotion. Whoever has any devotion also comes from Radharani. So that's why her devotion is supreme. Okay. I didn't understand the part of the story how um, her, you know, saying that you know she can't walk anymore. How, did, how is that supposed to lead to okay. Krishna? I didn't want to go into the full story. But the idea was, she thought that if I say I, won't, I can't walk any further, then she thought Krishna will sit down over here and will sit down and the other gopis are searching for us, they will find us. So otherwise if we just go deep into the forest, we will go so deep that the other gopis will not be able to find us. So she, was, she wanted to slow Krishna down so that the other gopis will find her. Okay. Yes, Prabhu. Quick comment and my question. There is the past time where Radharani complains to Krishna that they're, they're, they're speaking about my, my lack of chastity in Vrindavan. It's so bad. I think I'm just going to commit suicide because they, and then Krishna manifests this past time of carrying water in a pot that has a thousand uh, uh, holes in it. That's a whole past time, but Radharani does sometimes complain about that. Here's my question. You very wonderfully as you do all the time, you apply these higher principles to how you know to our struggles in devotional service. So my question is about sacrifice for Krishna. So we see in Prabhupada's life that sometimes he had a plan and Krishna didn't allow that plan to happen. Sometimes he just accepts it, like in Jansi. 
you know, he, he wanted this, he had this building in the, the, the League of Nations, and then the governor's wife wanted the building. So he didn't fight it so much, okay. But when the same thing happened in Bombay, and they tried, he fought like anything. So my question is, when something happens to us, we have a plan to serve Krishna. And if it doesn't happen, how do we know, oh, this isn't Krishna's plan, or no, I should fight. Krishna wants me to fight to get it done. How can we understand how to act in those circumstances? <laughs> Krishna. So when our plan is not working, how do we know when to stick to the plan and keep fighting for Krishna or when to let go of the plan and, uh, and uh, just accept it? I it, so, so just very quickly, Ajutananda once asked Prabhupada, how do I know how often to, to, to try to do something before I give up? And Prabhupada said, try three times and give up. <laughs> Try three times, okay. So, yeah. So broadly, it is purpose that gives perspective. So, you know, there is basically, there is a path and there is a purpose. The word Niyamagraha has two different meanings. Niyamagraha, one meaning is that you insist on the rule so much that you forget the purpose. The other meaning is that you just you just neglect the rule and the purpose both. So we could say that there is a purpose and there is a path to the purpose. Now on any path there will be challenges. So we need to face those challenges and we need to be willing to face those challenges. And that is how we walk on the path toward the purpose. But sometimes when we are walking on that path toward the purpose we may find that this path is just not leading me to the purpose. Then we may have to find another path. So the the attachment to, to the path should never become more than the attachment to the purpose. And it is when the attachment to the past path starts blinding us to the purpose this is what i have to do and at all costs no matter what happens that's when it becomes a problem so we may ourselves maybe discuss and decide that this much this is what i want to do this is what to the extent to which i will endeavor and within this endeavor if it works good it is often um, it is when we when we limit our challenges then we can challenge our limits. If you are trying to take too many challenges, then we can't face anything. We limit our challenges. Okay, this battle, I can't fight right now. This battle is what I'm going to fight right now. So when we limit our challenges, then we can challenge our limits. So we need to uh, we calmly do some introspection to see uh, how much to endeavor. Rahupad was determined in purpose, but he was quite discerning in his practice what to take forward. So sometimes it is good to talk with devotees who are like-minded but who are also outside. Maybe they can give some perspective. Mm -hmm. then, then we can learn. It's difficult but there is, we need to pray to Krishna, to consult some senior Vaishnavas and uh, then set some kind of limit. Maybe it will be a time frame or result, result count, result count, something we have to put. Okay, I am going to give this much time for this and if it works, good. If it does not, then it is not that I am giving up, but rather I may have to give up this path. It is not, it's not an easy decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Can you help me understand a little bit about to see Sita in the context of Radharani. Kind of well, okay. How can we see Sita? Sita in, how can we see Sita in relationship with Radharani? Generally, there is in scripture when one particular character is to be glorified, 
everyone else becomes like a agent or instrument for the glorification of that character. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when in the seventh canto, Prahlad's devotion is being glorified, then it is described that even Lakshmi cannot decide to pacify Narasimhadev. She doesn't even try to pacify Narasimhadev. And so actually, in the and none of them can pacify, then it is Prahlad who pacifies. Now, is it that Prahlad's devotion is greater than Lakshmi Devi's? Well, that is difficult to say. Lakshmi Devi is the Madhurya Ras. So, uh, but in that particular pastime, everything is aligned so that the glory of Prahlad is demonstrated. Now, even Narad Muni is said to be bowing down to Hiranyakashi, but Prahlad does not bow down to him. Now, how can Narad Muni bow down? Is Narad, Narad Muni is not afraid of death or anything. But in that situation, to highlight the absolute dominance of Hiranyakashipu and then the extraordinariness, extraordinariness of Prahlad's resistance, the whole setting is arranged like that. So similarly, when we are meditating on Radha Ashtami, about Radharani's glories, then we may use some other reference points to illustrate the glory of Radharani and even Sita's devotion, Sita's sacrifice might can be seen or shown to be lesser than Radha's. But we could take some other frame of reference and we can even glorify Sita's, Sita's uh, uh, devotion. And in the Brihad Bhagavata Amrita, there is a very endearing transcendental subjectivity. That means that when the Gop Kumar goes to Ayodhya and he sees over there that he is initially delighted to be in Ayodhya, first he is delighted to be in Vaikuntha, then he goes to Ayodhya and wherever he goes in Vaikuntha, the Vaikuntha Vasis think that Vishnu is, the, Vishnu is the ultimate divinity and I think Vishnu is the source of Krishna. In Ayodhya they think that Ram is the source of Krishna. And Vriyad Bhagavata Amrut does not say actually they are wrong. It is for them that is the ultimate reality. So, there is nowadays there is the idea of postmodernism where everything is made relative. So, even that has its pure form where it is not that everything is relative, but the relativity based on affection is not a sign of uh, lack of knowledge but it is a sign of love that transcends knowledge. So, similarly, in this frame of analysis, when we are doing, we see that Sita sacrifices for Krishna, for Ram and her love is glorious because she, she, she stays faithful to Ram while going to the forest, she stays chaste to Ram even when she is abducted and threatened and she, she stays faithful to him even when Based on based on just an based apparently on an unsubstantiated accusation, Ram sends her away. So her her in one sense her her love is also glorious because you know because she is the queen. So everything that happens to her is far greater public knowledge. It's what happens to Radha at least at that time in Vrindavan. Vrindavan is a small village. Krishna kept his connection with Rindavan low profile and he says intentionally that he keeps it low profile so that none of his enemies will ever attack Rindavan. So he makes it appear to the world that actually I just happen to live in Rindavan. It's like say, say, say a, a, a student or a child maybe lives in some foster home or lives in some hostel and you live it and then you forget it. So, Krishna acts like that. So, that is why everything that happens over there is not so well known. So, Sita's love is also great. But as I said that the Krishna demonstrates dharma in increasingly complex situations. And similarly, his bhakti, the, the, the bhakti of his devotees including Radha is also demonstrated in increasingly complex situations. So, that, is, that selflessness, that sacrifice, uh, in situations where moral lines become increasingly blurred, that is what is demonstrated by Radharani. Does it answer your question or was your question something else? No, I mean, partly, I mean, it's, I guess it is a complex kind of 
Yeah, so from Tattva point, Tattva point of view, like I said, Radharani is the source of the love of everyone. So you could say Radharani is the source of love of Sita, or the Bhakti of Sita also. But they are one in, they are, they are, so Radharani and Sita are one and different. But that is like, that is, so Sita's love is a categorically at a different level than you could say, uh, the love of an ordinary devotee in any other rasa. So it's way, way higher. But still within Madhuri rasa also there are grades. Okay. Thank you. Yes, one last question. Thank you. There is just a question. When, when we have a Radha Krishna deities, so when people ask, what is the relationship between them? So how do you answer based on their past times were on the Bauman, Vrindavan 5,000 years ago? Or based on their relationship in the spiritual world. How, what is the Radha Krishna deity's uh, relationship? Okay. What is the nature of the Radha Krishna relationship? Especially new people ask, how do we explain that? So basically, the first point to understand is that they are the divine consorts. So Krishna is the is God in the absolute in the female male form, Radha is God in the female form. And they are the divine couple. So that's the straightforward answer. Now, if somebody asks, but were they, were they married as queen and as a king and queen or whatever, then we need to explain. A simplest explanation is that consider a drama in which there are various characters. And say there is there is a couple who are happily married, but in that drama they're playing a role where the woman is married to someone else and then they have a relationship and the whole setting is done so that all the adventure all the fear all the suspense see for a husband and the wife to meet each other there after the few initial maybe few months or few years there's not much adventure <laughs> there's not much danger uh, there, there can be various kinds of dangers, but <laughs> the, the, the point of meeting is not very difficult. But uh, here the setting is made in such a way that co it's constantly sacrifice, danger, adventure is required for their union to take place. So in the setting, in the drama, they are, they are not married. But in actuality, they are married. The actuality, they are a couple. So that is how in Tattva, Krishna and Radha are the divine couple. In Leela, it, they are related in Parkiras. So we shouldn't emphasize the Parkiras so much. The, the Rasa, see there is the Tattva and there is Rasa. So if we emphasize the Rasa so much that the Tattva is not understood, or Tattva is downplayed, then those who are not rasika, they will misunderstand. So we need to emphasize the tattva strongly. Right? They are the divine couple, but for the intensif for the for the reciprocation of intense love, they are arranged in a setting where there is opposition. The whole idea is that love is or the strength, any strength is seen when there is opposition. Say if an elephant is uh, rushing towards the she-elephant or elephant is rushing towards water. Now the elephant can run very fast but the elephant is tied. It's difficult to run. The elephant is tied to a big big tree and the elephant brings down, it's a baby elephant who is now growing up and the baby elephant brings down the big tree. Then how much strength it has. The audience can see that and the baby elephant also discovers, oh I didn't know I had so much strength. So the strength is internally experienced and externally expressed when there is opposition. Similarly, the love of the gopis for Krishna, especially the love of Radha for Krishna, it is more experienced and expressed when it is restricted by another tie. So it is a setting. So it is, it is a, it is a leela, but the tattva is important. So if you focus on the tattva and people accept, that's good enough. Somebody ask further question, 
then explain the Leela, but then emphasize, come back and emphasize the Tattva again. Okay? It's interesting because Jiva Goswami in the Gopal Champu has Radha and Krishna, Radha, Krishna and the Gopis all married. Yes. Because he was worried about misunderstanding. On the other side, Prabhupada pushed the distribution of the Krishna book, which shows the, um, the how to say, the dramatic um, uh, interaction of Radha and Krishna. And therefore, forces us to have to be explain, to explain it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, so Jiva Goswami has talked about the marriage of Radha Krishna. That is after Krishna comes back to Vrindavan and then they married. So see basically, again this is a big subject, I'll just make two quick points for this. That, like I talked about transcending dharma and honoring dharma. So, now Krishna's pastimes can happen in many different ways at different times. And Jiva Goswami, what he described in Gopal Champu, it is something which uh, is, will be accepted by those who accept the authority of Jiva Goswami. Mm -hmm. Now, he of course draws on Vedic Shastras, but the vivid details of the pastime which he is talking about, that we don't, we don't find them in the Shastras. Now, of course, we could say there are various explanations given by our Acharyas. So, for example, one explanation is that, when all the Gopas had expanded, and Krishna had expanded all, as all the Gopas, that's the time when all the Gopis got married to them. So they all are married to Krishna only. There's another pastime, I think, in the uh, Brihan Narad, no, it is in the Brahma Vaivarta Puran, about how Brahmaji actually performs the marriage of Radha and Krishna. So there are various occasions when there is a duly wedded relationship also, but uh, that is not the prominent mood. That is, the marriage itself is performed in secret, you could say, at least the, uh, later two word, the, in the later two books. So therefore, that suspense and that uh, adventure, all that is still there. So now when Prabhupada gave the book, Krishna book, told us to distribute the Krishna book to everyone, what he did was, he made sure that we would never forget the Tattva. So time and time and time again, he reminds us of the Tattva. And if the Tattva is reminded of, then when we see the Rasa, the Leela, we won't misunderstand so much. So the idea is that, you know the upside down tree metaphor, upside down tree metaphor. So there is a reflected mango, there is the, there is the, say the water level and there is the real mango. Mm -hmm. So the world and its relationships are like the reflected mango. The Radha Krishna relationship is like the pure mango, the original mango. So now, when we are guided by Prabhupada and the Acharyas, then when we see the real mango, we understand that this is a real mango different from the different from the reflected mango. And then on seeing the real mango, the desire for the reflected mango goes away. But if we do not have adequate philosophical conviction or we do not have adequate devotional purification, then instead of the real mango directing us away from the reflected mango, the real mango might remind us of the reflected mango. And therefore, although the Krishna book is distributed widely, Prabhupada also said, be cautious. If you read those pastimes of Ras Dila, and that agitates you, then use your common sense and don't read right now. So Prabhupada gave us the picture of the real mango also, but then he told you, if you, if you are still remembering the reflected mango so much, then at this time don't look at the real mango. So don't look at at least those pastimes. So thank you very much. Srimati Radharani ki, Prabhupada ki, Taigaur Premanande.